Well, we were hanging out as young kids in East Baltimore in the street, and a uh, Jeep uh, drove up on the corner that we were hanging out on. Uh, in fact, it was the corner of Wolf and Eager Street in East Baltimore, and asked us, did we want to join the reserves? Uh, we were all black kids. And uh, we said, sure, we'd take a crack at it. But we thought we were going to be a part of the reserve center down on Falls Road. But the place that he told us to report to was Richmond Market Armory on Howard and uh, Biddle Street. And we found then that the, uh, it was a segregated uh, military unit with all blacks. We didn't know any better. And being young fellas, we didn't realize that the army was actually segregated. And, uh, and we just took it as, as, uh, as a, another means of in additional income because they were promising us $21 every three months, pay as a private. And uh, that was good for school money and buying books and stuff like that, extra money in your pocket. And now you gotta remember, this was back in 1948, 49. And they gave us like an orientation of a unit and it was a truck company. And they had all these big trucks uh, lined up on the street on Linden Avenue. And uh, they told us young fellas that we'd be able to drive trucks, shoot rifles, and do all the things that soldiers do. And, uh, but we would be in the National Guard, not the Army Reserve. We didn't realize that the Army was really segregated because we thought it was the norm. I experienced serious segregation at Fort Bend in Georgia. We actually went through separate uh, serving lines in the dining hall. Fort Rucker, Alabama, blacks couldn't eat in the uh, PX, the post exchange, places like that. We had to eat outside on the grounds around the, uh, the building. Uh, Camp Polk, Louisiana, we were always out the back of the base. You know, it's an area out back. Even when we went to uh, Fort Hood, Texas, uh, we were assigned a, a section of what we call Tent City, a place called South Hood out of Waco. And, uh, but there again, we kind of like thought it was a norm, but we knew it was segregation then. There were some advantages to being in a segregated unit because you didn't have to compete for rank and stuff like that army-wide. All you had to do was be better than the guys in your unit. I uh, went on active duty, came back uh, in 1952 to 1953. We had no unit because our unit was still in Okinawa. The headquarters unit was still in Okinawa. So uh, we start drilling in uh, one of the uh, warrant officers' living room over in the uh, McCullough Street projects. We were just meeting over there. And then in December of 1953, he said, well, we got an armory. They gave us an old building down on the corner of Emerson Avenue and Bentlow Street next to the firehouse. It was like an old warehouse, and they gave us uh, that building for an armory. Army for the colored troops. In the meantime, the black officers were coming back from overseas, from Korea and Okinawa, and, but they refused to come back to an all-black unit. And there was a lot of controversy there. One year at Indian Town Gap, down in Area 13, uh, we were finishing our annual training and the uh, state adjutant general came out to visit the colored troops and said, we're gonna build you boys your own armory. And that was when uh, they broke ground for the armory over at Winchester and uh, Bradish Avenue, which is now the Cade Armory. Uh, during the rides in uh, Cambridge and Princess Anne, our unit was sent to Cambridge as part of the uh, 121st Engineer Battalion. I was then uh, probably a Sergeant First Class. Um, Adjutant General was a fellow by the name of Gelston, General Gelston. And he came to town. and. Uh, the two activists told him, General, you, might, you, know, uh, you may as well get on your plane and fly back to Baltimore. We have nothing to discuss. And he wanted to know what was the problem. She said, your National Guard is segregated. He says, what are you talking about? She says, you got black troops over the elementary school, white troops over the high school, black troops on one corner, a white troop on another corner, black troops in this Jeep, white troops in that Jeep. And he turned around and told the battalion command, they said, get this thing scraped out right now. And at that point, we integrated. That battalion integrated. Uh, in fact, we had dual assignments. Every corner was a black and a white. Uh, the only thing that they didn't do was uh, integrate the quarters. But all the assignments from that point on was actually integrated assignments with uh, mixed troops and 
in all their, at the, all the duty stations and duty points. That was the first integration that I experienced in the uh, Royal National Guard in September 1963. I saw an influx of uh, black officers uh, distributed throughout the Guard. I, it, it became of a, uh, it became more of a, well, I became more based on qualifications rather than color. You know, you had to meet the qualifications. If you met the qualifications, then you could do the job. Then it was, a, and you met the uh, criteria. It, it was difficult to say no, you know, if you applied for a position or something like that. Jim Gilliam, he was my first commander, first commander I ever met in my life. And uh, he was a captain over at the old segregated 231st Transportation Truck Battalion. I really admired him. Then I had a first sergeant by the name of Clinton Nichols. Um, and back in those days, you never talked to the company commander. If the first sergeant couldn't solve your problem, you didn't have a problem. See, the Maryland Guard offered you opportunities that you really didn't get on uh, active duty. The Maryland Guard gave you an opportunity to stay as a civilian, to remain a civilian, and then become part of the military community at the same time, and also be eligible for military retirement and other benefits. That's, that was one of the best things that ever happened to me, is to stay and retire as a, a soldier in the Maryland National Guard.